what's uh, really interesting <laughs> when it comes to optics is really the physical or wave optics. That's really um, where um, the where you should feel comfortable with, because um, the kind of stuff that we cover with the physical slash wave optics, it, um, it, it shows up in quantum mechanics, um, some related concepts show up in quantum mechanics. So let's see, where should I start with this? Um, I mean, so let me start out with the phrase. That's the chapter headings. Interference and diffraction, at least that's the starting point. Interference and diffraction. And I guess even when we are reviewing, I would start out with the same concept that we started out with which is um, kind of uh, too easy for you to ignore when you're just looking at the formulas, you know, what is the angular positions of double solid interference maximum or whatever. Um, the key concept that you should feel comfortable with now is the idea of a phase. It's a word that you have seen in different contexts before. Um, so I think I'm, we mentioned the phases of moon. Um, and you have seen phase angle whenever we did oscillation and waves in physics 4A. You have seen phase angle. So the word phase itself is not new in your vocabulary. But what may not have gotten clearly communicated to you is the significance of phase. So phase becomes significant when you are talking about interference because Phase is what gives you, is this what you're seeing going to be constructive interference or destructive interference? So, um, so we, we have so phase or phase difference, delta phi. So for constructive interference, the phase difference is an integer multiple of 2 pi, or integer multiple of a whole cycle. That's what phase refers to, different parts of a cycle. Um, and for destructive interference, oops, the phase difference is an um, old multiple of, um, <sighs> you could call it old multiple of pi, or I guess the, another way to put it is it's a half integer multiple of 2 pi, or always by half of a cycle, so, or something like n plus 1 half times 2 pi. Different ways of writing it, but it comes down to when you have a two full, um, when you have two things that have a matching, cycles that match up add up, you get constructive interference, amplification of whatever effect it is. And when you have two things that are kind of off by, um, it, we call this out of phase. When they are kind of out of step by half of a cycle, then you get destructive interference. Um, I say this is the most important one because the kind of formulas you might kind of memorize, have it written down in your book or you know, index card, it, um, you can let just drive it. it. The derivation is actually pretty simple um, if you just remember this relationship to phase and the geometric relationships. Because, <laughs> um, um, so, um, starting from the phase is where you can analyze two different types of interference. So those two different, uh, two, two different geometric setups that you have seen are one relating to double solid interference And this is, and what we call single slit diffraction actually kind of falls under double slit interference. It's still the same geometry. It, uh, so uh, I guess I should draw the geometry here. The geometry for double slit interference is that you have two sources of wave that uh, may be along a plane. And these two sources could be two sources because it's two slits. 
or in case of a single slit uh, diffraction, you are actually just picking two points as the wavelet using Huygens principle. So you have two sources of wave, and you look at the path length to uh, another point in space. And you, you, we only do the far field uh, interference, not the near field interference. So you can always assume that this point is super far away, which means the path from these two points to that point super far away is essentially parallel lines. So once you remember that far, then hopefully at some point you remember that the path length difference is given by this tiny bit here. This is the path length difference. And um, if you remember the path length difference, wavelength, um, then um, how, phase um, how phase relates to the particular point on the cycle, then you can kind of uh, construct the formula f without knowing really anything else. Because this path length difference divided by the wavelength gives you um, fraction of a cycle. So, but that's uh, in terms of fraction of a cycle. Phase is an angle, it's in terms of radians. So you have to multiply this by 2 pi. That gives you the phase difference between these two. So that is the delta phi. And you know, you could have this written down in your index card, but what I'm trying to tell you is that if you understood the phase, how they relate to a periodic phenomena, then this is something that you could just guess. Like, you don't ever need to have it memorized. Um, and once you have this, then the kind of, once you have this and this, then the formulas for the double solid interference maxima and the minima, it's something that you can really simply drive. Um, so there's the double slit interference, and there's also single slit. And with the single slit diffraction, the innovation there is that um, you analyze where the the diffraction minima would be by kind of pairing up two points in a way they cancel out, and you can move move those paired points to cover the entire slit. So you should do, uh, so let me at least put it as a, under parenthesis, single slit diffraction. They both cover same geometry. So with a single slit diffraction, really the only thing that's being added is a kind of a clever arrangement to make it mathematically easier for you to calculate where the minima should be. And I think that your textbook is a little bit sloppy about where the maxima are. And, I, and your lab manual was also fairly sloppy about this, so I just want to be sure. The maximum is not exactly at the same place as where the simple thing would tell you. It's because there's two different facts. So I guess you can leave it here. I will never really ask you about single solid diffraction maxima, except for the central maxima. Like, anything else I ask about single solid diffraction will be about the minima, because minima you can calculate exactly using just algebra. Maxima, you need a calculus, and uh, I don't have enough time for that. Um, so that's one arrangement. The other arrangement you should also expect to see on your exam, possibly. Not as important as this, not as uh, widely applicable as this, but it's what we, what's covered under thin film interference. And this arrangement is qualitatively different from the double slit interference. One, the geometric arrangement is different. This involves reflection. And because it involves reflection, there's a, a phase shift that you may need to worry about that's associated with that reflection. So um, this is the picture that I want you to remember that um, in the simplest possible thin film interference setup, we would be dealing with the two surfaces that are parallel. And let's say even when they're not parallel, we are going to kind of approximate them as parallel. Because all we are going to care about is the distance between them, not angle between them. We are not going to do any additional geometry on it. In fact, even when we say the light is incident on it, even though sometimes we might draw it as the it's coming in at some angle. Um, we are kind of assuming that this angle is small enough that you can think of it as a normal incidence. Either a question might say normal incidence or you're looking at it directly above. Um, even though in some of the rings, your angle is not exactly normal, we are going to say it's normal enough. Um, so 
with this arrangement, the key thing that you are looking at is, once again, the phase difference. Um, phase difference between path 1, the return path 1, and path 2, which involve, covers additional distance. Covers additional distance. So this total phase difference is sum of phase difference due to difference in the distance. And here, you have to go back, account for index of refraction, change of wavelength, <laughs> remember all this stuff. Um, and the second part that you need to be aware of are possible change the phase due to reflection. So there's a rule that I gave you. How many people remember the rule on phase shift on reflection that's not gouger? <laughs> yeah, it was like if it's going from something that's greater index of refraction, uh, bouncing off something that's lesser, it flips. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Maybe it's this one. Looks long. No, that's just complex exponential. Um, and I probably used that for question 14. Yeah, guided tutorial and derivation of intensity pattern. So I don't know why your textbook skips this, because this is kind of basic building block for the single solid diffraction interference pattern. Um, but so let me just uh, talk about the uh, uh, intensity pattern for double solid interference. That's the pa uh, heading I want to put it under, uh, intensity pattern for double slit. And you know, there are some, so you can go back to the assignment, review what was covered there. But the key ideas here is that, well, you are looking at um, interference. So you are using superposition principle to add two different waves on top of each other. So when you look at the total electromagnetic wave, the total electric field is simply the sum of electric field due to one source one source plus the electric field due to the other source. Now, I'm kind of oversimplifying here because these are expressions for waves. It's a function of position and time. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it's a function of position and time. And once you have the total intensity, then the, the, sorry, total electric field in the um, electromagnetic wave, then the intensity or the average is the, um, ele it's, uh, let me just put it this way. The intensity is proportional to the electric field squared. And um, this is a time dependent thing. So intensity is actually also a time dependent thing. So what we would uh, normally do is we are not interested in the time varying intensity. We don't really see the flickers in visible light anyway. So we are interested in the average intensity, which would be related to the, the RMS value of the um, electric field squared. All of this begin to ring a bell? Yes? Yeah, so this is the part that actually took a lot of calculation. So, um, you could do this with, uh, using a lot of trigonometry, um, but in this context, what I introduced as a calculational tool that you need later in the semester anyway is the complex exponential. So uh, might as well write it down somewhere in this portion of the review. So electric fields E1 and both E1 and E2, but let's say E1 can be expressed this way. It can be the electric field of magnitude, times, um, let's say we are looking at a single location, so we are looking at it just as a function of time, um, e to the i omega t, but this doesn't give you any possibility of distinguishing between one and two, so let's include a little phase factor that's going to be dependent on, is it electric field from location one or electric field from location two? And um, in the final expression, what you care about is the phase difference between them. So this representation of a physical, physical quantity using complex exponential is something that I really do want you to take away from this class. Because a lot of people who only have math background comes in with this um, incorrect understanding that complex numbers do not represent real things. They do represent real things. Complex numbers happens to re represent real things that are associated with periodic phenomena like waves or like your matter waves, um, things that oscillate at some, in some, at some level can be represented by complex quantities because it's really this complex phase that, you know, that becomes meaningful when you're dealing with something that's oscillating. Um, so this is how electric field is represented and uh, we kind of looked at this that the average quantity um, so with the complex numbers, you can do all the additions and subtractions fine. You have to be careful when you're multiplying or squaring. But I gave you a theorem, something about how when you're only interested in the time average, average the quantity, you can kind of safely do it because the average will be proportional to the um, complex thing, um, um, complex absolute squared, or rather 
the complex conjugate times the complex function itself. So that will kind of cancel out the time dependence, which um, kind of is how it's supposed to be. And like all this rings a bell, right? Yes. So the, all the stuff about complex numbers um, or complex exponentials You should do review and know. I mean, this is pre-calculus material, so I would feel less comfortable using it on a, introducing it on a trigonometry-based physics class. Not that I couldn't, but it's a matter of uh, a mathematical maturity that people who have only taken trigonometry haven't really, are not expected to have dealt with exponentials or complex exponentials, but, um, people who have taken calculus are supposed to have taken pre-calculus, which means you should have seen this at some level. So, and we spent some time going over it, so I want you to be able to use it in a, as an a, um, application to um, something where this mathematical tool is needed to analyze the physical phenomena. Yep. Um, and there's more in optics, but um, I think uh, you can kind of see where I'm not spending a lot of effort. So I haven't spent a lot of time on single slit diffraction, mainly because it's not the core topic. Not, doesn't mean you shouldn't study it, you should know it. You should know the formulas, you should know things that are related to it, but um, what, where do I want to be? Uh, but at the core level, really the core concepts are covered under double slit interference. And single slit diffraction is more of a application of the same core concept. In fact, once you have this mathematical tool, then single slit diffraction, um, the intensity pattern becomes a little bit easier to deal with. Did I give you a question where you had to do a bunch of integrals for single slit diffraction? Huh, I never gave you that. Really? I thought I remembered doing, a, oh, I did it in lecture, right? And I gave, never gave you a homework question. Okay, yeah. So things I did in lecture but never gave you a question on, you wouldn't be expected to be able to reproduce it. Or like if you were to, then it would be, have to be built as a tutorial. Where, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if I would order. But you know, you should know what uh, single solid diffraction is. You should know the basic formulas. Um, one, uh, two more things that I should make sure I cover are diffraction grading and Rayleigh, uh, uh, Rayleigh criteria. Criterion. So those are all, you know, more conceptual things. A couple simple formulas to memorize, but I'll just uh, tell you know write it down to make sure that you don't skip our audience. So the other kind of um, let me just put it under the heading of miscellaneous topics, um, which is not really the fair description. Diffraction grading is a super important. You guys use it for lab. It's used a lot, but. Um, I guess it's not the core concept because diffraction grading for a lot of different purposes, you can kind of treat it like a double slit interference thing if you are interested only in the interference maxima. So, <laughs> um, so with the caveats in mind, diffraction grading is something you are expected to know. And by the way, this is an example of how sloppy we physicists are when we use the word the diffraction. Because really what characterizes diffraction grading is the interference, not like diffraction as in spreading of waves. But I'm just telling you we are very sloppy when we use the word the diffraction. And uh, Rayleigh criteria. It, and at some conceptual level, Rayleigh criterion, um, or you know, that minimum resolvable angle for something coming from some circular aperture is related to the wavelength and the diameter of the aperture. If I remember the numbers right, it's 1.22 lambda over diameter of the aperture. Um, I mean, you should have the formula in your formula sheet. Well, what this is more important for is the, um, is more at a uh, kind of, at a fundamental conceptual level. Because this is what we refer to as diffraction limited resolution. As in, it doesn't matter what kind of a master builder you are, no matter how good you are building at optics or whatever, you will always be limited by this because it's in the very nature of the light that you are using. 
And this kind of ties into the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. The underlying wave nature fundamentally limits you in some things and it's a fundamental limit.